Unit 7.2 Combined Loading The course outcome that is the focus of this unit is to apply a knowledge of stress distributions to calculate stresses in structures under combined loading. In this lesson, the outcomes we will focus on are first, calculate stresses in structures under combined loading conditions, and second, construct a diagram for the state of stress on a stress element subjected to combined loading. Let's begin by reviewing member loading conditions and their associated stresses. The loading conditions we've considered so far in this course are axially loaded members, torsionally loaded members, beam members, and thin walled pressure vessels. The internal resultant load of an axially loaded member is an internal normal force. For a torsionally loaded member, the internal resultant force is an internal torque. And for a beam member, the internal resultant loads are both internal moments and internal shears. An internal normal force in a member results in normal stress, and that normal stress is equal to the internal normal force, P, divided by the cross-sectional area, A. An internal torque causes an internal shear stress, and the shear stress is calculated as the internal torque, T, times rho, which is a distance from the centroid of the cross-section to the point where stress is being evaluated, divided by the polar moment of inertia, J. For a beam-loaded member, an internal moment results in the formation of normal stress. And the normal stress can be calculated as M, the internal moment, times y, which is the distance from the neutral axis of the cross-section to the point where stress is being evaluated, divided by the moment of inertia of the cross-section, i. Internal shear force in a beam-loaded member results in the formation of shear stress. And shear stress, in this case, would be equal to the internal shear force, v, times q, divided by the moment of inertia, i, and divided by t, the width of the cross-section at the point where stress is being evaluated. Q is also evaluated as the area above or below the point where stress is being evaluated times the distance from the neutral axis of the cross-section to the centroid of that area. For thin-walled pressure vessels, we find normal stress in two directions in the pressure vessel wall. For a cylindrical pressure vessel, the hoop stress is sigma 1. It is equal to pressure times the internal radius divided by the wall thickness. In the axial direction, the stress is half that of the hoop stress. And it's given the notation sigma 2 equal to PR over 2T. For spherical pressure vessels, the stress in any direction is equal to sigma 2. In this lesson, we will consider members that are subjected to two or more of these conditions. And we will calculate stress at a point subjected to various internal resultant forces and stresses. We will discuss the concept of combined loading by looking at an example problem. A road sign is supported on a hollow post, as shown. The dimensions of the sign are shown. The weight of the sign is 1,500 pounds. The face of the sign is subjected to a wind force of 150 pounds per square feet. A cross-section of the post at 4 feet below the bottom of the sign is shown. Determine the state of stress at points A and B. Show the results on differential volume elements located at both points. We see the cross section of the pipe with an inner and outer radius given. The first step to solving a combined loading problem such as this, is to determine what the internal forces are at the cross-section of interest. And that's the cross-section where we are evaluating stress. And that's our cross-section shown here with the points A and B. Now, on a cross-section in a problem such as this, which is a three-dimensional problem, 
there can be three internal resultant forces on that cross section. One will be a normal force, and that's the force that's in the direction of the axis of the cross section. In our case, that's in the along the x axis. The other two forces, one in the y direction and one in the z direction, will be shear forces in our case because they are acting parallel to the face of the cross section. There is also the possibility for three internal moments about the three axes. A moment about the x-axis in our case is a moment about the axis of the member which is therefore a torque. The other moments occur about the y and z axes. These moments will be the result of bending about those two axes. So the first step in any combined loading problem is first to identify these internal forces. Let's look at them one at a time. The first force is the force in the x direction. That will be an axial force. And if we look at this cross section here, where A and B are located, we see that there is going to be an axial force acting down this post. And it's going to be of magnitude equal to the weight of the sign. It's going to be 1,500 pounds. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm transferring that weight of the sign through the post to this point. And that 1,500 pound axial load is acting in compression on the cross section. So I'm going to note that this is in compression with the letter C. Next, let's consider forces occurring in the y direction. We have the wind blowing on the sign, and it's the direction of the wind load is in the negative y direction. That will create a shear on this cross section in the y direction. And the magnitude of that shear force will be equal to our wind pressure, 150 pounds per square foot, multiplied by the area of the sign, which is 12 feet wide, 6 feet tall. That gives us a shear force in the negative y direction equal to 10,800 pounds. Now let's consider the z direction. There are no forces on our structure in the z direction. Now let's consider our three moments. The first is the moment about the x-axis, which is actually a, a torque, because it would be occurring about the axis of our member. And there is a torque, and it is the result of this wind load on the sign. And if we take the resultant force of the wind load, which we calculated above to be 10,800 pounds, it is acting through the centroid of the sign, which is at the very center. And that is six feet distance from the post. That will be our moment arm. So we can calculate the torque as 10,800 pounds times six feet, and I'm showing with the arrow, that six foot dimension. That is the moment arm that is creating the torque, and our torque has a value of 64,800 foot pounds. And it's a torque about the negative x axis using the right hand rule. Now let's consider moments about the y axis. There will be a moment about the y axis. That is a bending of the pole, and it is bending about the y axis because of this weight. It's the weight of the sign, which is 1,500 pounds. And it's 1,500 pounds acting at a distance of half of 12 feet over from the pole, which will be equal to 1,500 pounds times 6 feet. That's 9,000 foot-pounds. And that is bending about the negative y direction, according to the right-hand rule. Last, we will consider our moment about the z-axis. And there is a moment about the z-axis. It is the result of this wind force pushing on the sign and bending the pole back and bending it about the positive z-axis. The magnitude of that moment will be equal to the resultant force of the wind load acting on the sign, which is 10,800 pounds, times the moment arm, which is the distance from the centroid of the sign down to our cross section along the x-axis. That's going to be three feet to the bottom of the sign, from the centroid of the sign, plus an additional four feet to our cross section where it points A and B are located, for a total of seven feet. So the value will be 10,800 pounds times seven feet. That's equal to 75,600 foot-pounds, and it's a moment about the positive z-axis. This is a complex combined loading condition. We're going to simplify this problem by 
using the principle of superposition. And we're going to use the principle of superposition by considering each of these internal resultant loads and the resulting stresses as individual problems. So we, we will evaluate each one independently, find the resulting stresses, and then at the end of the problem, once we've considered all of these internal loads, we will combine our results to get the solution for the combined loading condition. Now that we have our internal forces and moments identified, the next step is to identify what is the stress equation for each of these internal resultant loads. And by considering the distribution of stress on the cross section, we will find the stresses for points A and B. For this discussion, I'm going to draw our two differential volume elements. This cube is a differential volume element which will be located at point A. It represents a tiny particle of the pipe material at point A. And this is cube represents the same particle of material but at point B. And the lines of the cube are oriented according to our x, y, and z axes for both cubes. Now let's begin with our normal resultant force. It's acting in the x direction, and it is a result of the sine weight, and it is in compression. And it's equal to 1,500 pounds. So the stress associated with an axial load is a normal stress, and it is calculated as the internal resultant load divided by the cross-sectional area. And if we think about the distribution of stress, it will be a compression stress, and it will be uniformly distributed about the cross-section. That means at points A and B, there will be compressive stresses, and they will be of equal magnitude. In fact, they will be the same magnitude anywhere on this cross-section. Now returning to the table, the stress equation for our axial force is sigma is equal to the axial force divided by A, the cross-sectional area. And sigma, our normal stress, will be the same at both points A and B, and will be a compression stress. So we can find the cross-sectional area as the area of the outer circle, subtract the area of the inner circle, and we get 4.52 inches squared. So the stress at point A is equal to our 1,500 pounds, which I will write as 1.5 kips with a negative sign, which indicates compression, divided by the cross-sectional area and we get a stress value of 0 0.33 KSI, the negative sign representing compression. At point B, it's the same calculation and the same stress. And now that stress is shown on our differential volume. Next, let's consider the shear force, which is occurring in the negative y direction. And it's a result of the wind load on the sign. And we found that that force is equal to 10,800 pounds. The equation that we will use to convert this internal shear force to a shear stress is shown here. Shear stress is equal to VQ over IT. And the distribution of stress is shown approximately by this parabolic distribution, where we have a maximum stress occurring on the neutral axis and a stress of zero at the ends. This is important to us, because we see that our point A lies on the neutral axis. That means there will be a shear stress at point A, and it will be the maximum stress, and it will be occurring in the negative y direction. So I will show that with this blue arrow here on the top of the element, which represents the top of this cross section. And you see, when I draw one arrow, three also appear. The three additional arrows are necessary to balance the stresses on this element. There will be the arrow on the bottom side of the element you see is pointing in the opposite direction of the stress on the top. And to keep this element from spinning, then the stresses on these two faces also appear in the orientation shown. There's only one option for drawing these other three remaining arrows that will result in a static equilibrium of our cube. Now let's consider point B. The stress at point B is zero because at this point our value for Q would also be zero. So there are no shear stresses at point B as a result of that internal shear force in the y direction. 